Well, we are going to talk about, we're going to continue our Press On series today, the second of two weeks talking about that, and we're going to be talking about being justified, and before we talk about what it is, let's talk about what it's not, and that is, it is in our human nature to seek justification for our actions. Typically, it's just a poor excuse, and here are some. I'm too old, I'm too young, I'm not talented enough. I don't have enough time. I wasn't born in the right area. I wasn't born to the right family. I came from a poor background. I'm not smart enough. I'm not tall enough. I'm not fast enough. I don't have the support that I need. My family and friends, they are, don't think that I'm capable. I didn't go to the right school. I'm too easily distracted by other things. I can't handle failure. Failure, And my favorite, I'll start it tomorrow. Henry Ford says, whether you think you can or cannot, you are right. We tend to make excuses for doing and not doing something or not being somewhere. I am a firm, firm believer that we make time for the things for which we want to make time. If it's important to you, you will figure it out. So if you say, I don't have time for that, technically you kind of do, but you're choosing to make other things a higher priority, and that's what you're giving your time for. It doesn't make it wrong. Every time you say yes to one thing, you say no to something else, and vice versa. When you say no to something, you're saying yes to something else. But to say we don't have time isn't accurate. We like to justify our action or inaction. But that is not the justification that we're referring to today. Our base passage, which our press-on series is in Philippians 3.14, I'm going to read it in the NIV, and that is that I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So we know that we have been kind of putting together a series Last week we talked about being sanctified, this week is justified, the start of which, or the the trilogy, as it were, of all three things is being circumcised. (gasps) Circumcised, Siri thought I said her name, sorry. I've been making fun of Anthony for months about his phone went off that one time. (laughs) She doesn't know anything about circumcision. Being circumcised, sanctified, and justified. Let's look in 1 Corinthians 6. That is justification for you, my my friend. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 11 says, and I didn't point this part out last week, I saved it for this. I did kind of like just say, hey, the previous verses, if you want to go back, you want to make a note and look at all the different things, but it talks about all these things that, that uh, about being a cheater and, and, you know, did you commit fornication and, and all these different types of things, thieves and covetous, you know, being jealous of other people's things, being a drunkard. But I love how verse 11 starts, such were some of you. Former you, B.C., before Christ. You were those things. That doesn't mean you are those things. Some of you were those things. Aren't you grateful for that were? Aren't you grateful that it's not a present tense that I am now today? I can look back and say, by the blood of Jesus Christ, those things are cleansed. Those things are covered. Those things are redeemed is one of the words we're going to talk about today. That's what I were. That's not proper English, but it communicates what we're talking about. Thank you, Lord. And such were some of you, but you were washed. Thank you, Lord. You were sanctified. That's what we talked about last week. And you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Notice here the past tense usage of all of it. So let's talk about what this last one means. Justified. That word means to render righteous or sought, excuse me, such as he ought to be or she. To show one to be righteous, such as he is, 
wishes himself to be considered, to declare, pronounce, one to be just, righteous, and this is my favorite part, such as he ought to be. It's a purposing of God that we will walk in righteousness, as we ought to be. It's our choice whether we step into it. It's available for you. Will you choose to walk into that which you ought to be? That's justification. It's not something that's put off in the sweet by and by. It's not something we're talking about when we get to heaven. It's not a carrot that is in front of you that can never be attained. There's a person I spoke to, a Jewish woman. She was telling me about all the different sacraments and things they had to do during the different times. Super interesting. But one thing she said, she goes, the frustrating thing is, though, we'll never attain to where we're supposed to be, even in doing all these things. I was like, wow. I said, isn't that frustrating? She goes, you don't even know. That is not something that we're talking about here. The Lord hasn't said, hey, walk in righteousness. By the way, you can't do it doesn't work like that justify many people have said that word means just as if i have never sinned let's look at romans 3 this will be our where we'll spend majority of our time today Romans 3, we'll start in verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, that is a very familiar passage. This is part of what is called the Roman road. When you're demonstrating to someone, you're sharing the gospel with someone, you have to first of all lay out that, hey, by the way, all of us have sinned. Okay? We're all, we've fallen short of the glory of God. Demonstrate to that to them. Show that and say, hey, here's where it shows scripturally that all of us have sinned. So now what do we do? And then you go on, continue on to show them the need for a Savior and what the Lord can provide for them as part of, of the salvation message. But if we, we're not stopping there today. For all of sin have fallen short of the glory of God. 24. Being justified freely through the redemption. Now, before we get to that, though, if we were to stop at 23, it's kind of depressing. For all short, fall short, and they sin, that's it, right? Because we know that from Ezekiel 18.20, it says that soul that sins shall do what? Die. So if you have any knowledge of that, for all have fallen short and all have sinned, and you know that Ezekiel says that if you sin, you'll die, well, that's kind of, that's rough. But Ezekiel says, and I, and I intentionally I had a whole section on this today, but I took it out. I think the Lord is directing for us to devote a week to it. Maybe next. We'll see. But Ezekiel says in there, turn and live. Yes. So you have to come back next week to hear about that. <laughs> or listen from the broadcast in Florida. The good news is, however, Paul did not stop there. He says in verse 24, being justified, which means declared righteous, freely, by the grace through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. I can't believe that Paul did not put an exclamation point right there. I mean, that is something to be declared. You, your destiny is death because you sinned. However, you have been freely declared righteous. Last week, paid in full, that is in Jesus Christ. So let's look at this. Pay attention to the words you read. If you don't know what they mean, look it up. Have a further understanding of what it is that you're reading and studying. That's always how I prepare. That's always how I read. Even if you don't own a Strong's Concordance, I don't use a physical one anymore. Just you Google it, put in Strong's Concordance, and it pulls up it's a website. I don't even know what it is. It's like this long. But it has a digital strong concordance. You can actually get, I have one on my phone, a, dig, a strong concordance app. And you can look at the words and see what they mean. See other verses that are use the same exact word. 
gives you a greater understanding of what is in Scripture. Freely. We're justified freely. It doesn't have to be a struggle. That word freely means undeservedly. We don't deserve this, but it is freely given. If you don't deserve it, it means you, guess what? You also can't earn it. Isn't that liberating? This is not something that we can earn. It's not something if I'm good enough, if I pray enough, if I go to church three times a month and I'll be able to get this job. It doesn't work like that. Undeservedly, it's freely given. By his grace, which we know is his unmerited favor, through the redemption of That, once again, is where it's paid in full. You drove the nail through it. That is in Christ Jesus. Redemption is liberation procured by the payment of a ransom. We were held hostage and were dead in our sins, but Jesus came and paid it all. Aren't you glad for that? Big Daddy Weave sings a song that says, I am redeemed, you set me free. So I'll shake off these heavy chains, wipe away every stain. Now I'm not who I used to be. I am redeemed. We have something to show you today.
Aren't you grateful? You are not who you used to be. Some of you were. You know when, oh, and by the way, those that were listening to the live broadcast, because of copyright, we're not allowed to play that, but the link will be in below the the video so that you can see that as well. But how many of you use lists, to-do lists? Yeah? What do you do after you complete the task? You cross it out. Do you come back and do it again? No. Is that signifies that it's done, taken care of, no longer needs to be revisited? Hello, are you hearing me? Do you see what happened there? They crossed those things out. I was addicted to drugs. Crossed out, put a cross on there, redeemed. Grateful for that. Grateful for that. Thank you, Lord, for your redemption. Hebrews 9, 22, and the second half of the verse says, Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Where there is sin, someone has to die in order for the sin to be paid for. Continuing on here. Through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. We're in verse 25 now in Romans 3. Whom God set forth as a propitiation. Well, that's kind of a big word. What does that mean? I'm glad you asked. The word propitiation actually represents the mercy seat. That was on the Ark of the Covenant. We'll talk about it in a second. I want to tell you what it's for, and then I'll tell you what, how it all comes together. What that's referring to is the atonement for sin. Webster's actually says propitiation is the act of regaining favor with someone. Atonement is reconciliation between a sinful mankind and a holy God. That's exactly what atonement is. So, this says God set forth as a propitiation. In Levitic, if you want to read this and, and study it up, in Leviticus 16, it talks about the Day of Atonement, which was the seventh, uh, tenth day excuse me, of the seventh month. And so every year what would happen is the high priest, the high priest only, would go into the Holy of Holies. Now we have in the outer court, give you a little 30-second overview here, we have in the tabernacle of the Lord, we've done it on several occasions, maybe it's time to do it again, we had the tabernacle setting, and that was an outer court where everybody was allowed to go. And then there was a building that was closed off, and in the, in the outer court it was open air. And the building that was closed off, in that there was a holy place where the priests were allowed, and they go and they served every single day. And then there was a most holy place is where the representation of where the presence of God was in the Ark of the Covenant. This is in the Old Testament prior to Jesus. And they would, that's where the Ark was. Everybody has seen, you know, Raiders of the Lost Ark. That's what they're supposed to be searching for, right? So you've seen it, it's gold, and it had, they had these uh, big old rods that they used to carry it when they did it right. And it, on top of that, it had two angels, cherubim they called them, and their wings were coming in like this, okay? And in there was this mercy seat. So that's what I was talking about. Every year the high priest would go on the Day of Atonement, and he would make a sacrifice, give sacrifice, not only for himself, because he had to go in there, but he'd also for the rest of the Israelite people. And he would go, and he would sacrifice for their sins once a year. And he would atone for them. So that this sinful man would be made right with the holy God. That's what's happening in the atonement. Okay? This would happen once a year. And he wore this big long robe, and they tied a rope around his, his ankle, and he would have to walk back and forth while he was in there. The reason why he did that, because they couldn't go in there and watch, the reason why they did that is because if they didn't hear the bells ringing that were on the bottom of, his, uh, of the jet coat that he was wearing, I guess you could kind of call it, that if they didn't hear the bells ringing, that means he was dead. And he was not in the right place to be walking into the presence of God. Because up until that point, we weren't allowed to approach. We didn't have that advocate. We didn't have the blood of Jesus that cleanses us. So they were the only thing they could do. One guy, one time a year, he would be able to go into this, this place, right? Aren't you glad that the veil was rent? <laughs> Can you imagine having to do this once a year and have to go to this man? That's craziness. Anyways, so he had to walk back and forth. Otherwise, because if he was dead, they couldn't go get him. That's why they tied the rope around his ankle. They would have to pull him out. So this is the Day of Atonement. This is what the history of this is talking about. All of that I just told you, by the way, 
was through that word propitiation. How many times are we in Scripture and we're like, set forth as a, that's a big word, I don't know what that is, by his blood and continue on, right? I've done it too. Take a second, stop, pause, find out what that word is. Now I just gave you an entire history of what all that means. Doesn't it put it in perspective now a little differently when you're reading this, if you know that history and background? Whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood. So we know when he died on the cross, this is what he's completing this work. It says that Jesus was the lamb that was slain, the perfect lamb that was slain before the foundations of the world. All those sacrifices that were done in the Levitical order in the Old Testament, they were came and they point directly to Jesus. And when he came, he didn't do away with the law. He came and fulfilled it. Okay? So understand something. There is a, as a thought out there in the church that Jesus came and he did away with the Old Testament. And the only thing we have to worry about is the new. That is not accurate whatsoever. He came and fulfilled the Old Testament. He was the perfect sacrifice that allowed us now to be able to approach the throne boldly with grace because he rent that veil when he was on the cross and he said it is finished. It says that the earth shook and that veil was rent, giving you access to that throne of God. You don't have to go through a man anymore. You don't have to come to me. You don't have to go to pastor and say, here's my sins, what I do. You can go boldly before the throne of grace and you can approach him and say, Lord, I've fallen short. I've done it again, but here I am. I'm willing to repent. I'm willing to turn, but here I am today, Lord. I come boldly before you because I can have the assurance that you will redeem me. Lord, you'll bring that, you'll be that atonement for me and make me in right standing as if it never happened again. That's what that red veil did. <clears throat> By his blood. Through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because of his forbearance God had passed over the sins. Now that for word forbearance is kind of important in my world right now. Because a lot of people went through their mortgage forbearance and kicked their mortgage three months down the road. Myla and I did a, a video called Forbearance is Whack. And when I saw, because people got, a lot of people didn't understand it and they got themselves in trouble. You can call me on a Tuesday, we'll talk about it. Um, but anyways, in his forbearance, that just means that his tolerance. God tolerated the sin of man. He restrained himself. Continuing on here, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. Once again, if you run past that, what is it talking about? Well, I'm glad you asked. Right when the children of Israel were enslaved and in bondage to Egypt, we know about the plagues that came. The tenth one, was when they, the death of the firstborn, firstborn son. What they told them to do is, listen, if you will apply the blood, listen to this, apply the blood of the lamb over your household, that death angel, when he comes, has, he sees that blood and says, nah, I don't have any access to that. I have to go to the next one. And if he goes to the next one and the blood is applied there, ugh, I got to go to the next one now. So what they did, and there were people that, I guarantee you, there were people in the, in the Egyptian camp that were like, what's going on with these Israelites? Why, why are they putting blood on their house? You know, there's been some things that have been going down with us lately. I, I think I might want to do whatever they do, right? And as a result, even though they didn't even understand it, watch this, the blood of the lamb still covered them, and that death angel had to pass over them as well. But what we can do now, we don't have to go out and, and, and slay a lamb. But what we can do is we can apply the blood of Jesus over our household and say, Lord, this is your house. Fathers, you can say, this is my family. Death angel, you have to pass over. You go to somebody else's house. You don't have any right to my house. You don't have any right to my family. That's what it's talking about when they passed over. We can still do that today. And I said to the fathers very intentionally, that's not sexist. That is how God has ordained that we are the spiritual head of the home and you are to plead the blood of Jesus over your household. And if, ladies, if your husband's not willing to do it, you do it then. Passover. His righteousness, because of his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. You know, some of us may not fully surrender because we feel like we could never be good enough. And you don't want to be hypocritical. 
and I actually respect that. However, none of us will ever be good enough. Continuing on here, and I'll show you why that matters. To demonstrate, verse 26, at the present time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the what? Justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Faith. It doesn't say the one who is good enough to be justified. The one who does fill in the blank. Enough things but who has faith in Jesus. Sometimes this thing, faith, it is so simple, but we make it so difficult. Because of the fact that it is so, so, so little, we have this mentality that I have to earn it, I have to do it, I have to make sure I do all these things. And all he's saying is, just trust me and have faith in me. Oh, that's way too easy. I can't do that. Way too easy. Reminds me when I used to work at Quicken, and there were a ton of, of Muslim guys I would talk to. That's probably the only thing that I miss about being there, is being able to share the gospel with those Muslim men. But we were talking one time, and, and I don't even remember how the conversation started, but I said, you know, it's just a matter of trusting and believing in the Lord. All we have to do is accept him. All we have to do is, I didn't use, you know, confess with our mouth. I didn't really understand that kind of stuff, but I used in terminology that he'd understand. And he said, after I got done explaining, he goes, that's way too easy. There has to be more to it than that. I mean, I, I don't have to, you know, stand on one foot and do a jumping jack or, you know, there has to be something more that I have to do why would he think that? It's a works mentality. You know, we may laugh and snicker a little bit, but do we do the same thing? Well, I, I, this is happening in my life because of these things that I've done. Or these things are happening in their life because of the things that they did. He is the justifier. And we are made righteous through, says, his righteousness, his actions, not our own. It is his righteousness working through us, and none of us will ever be good enough in our own strength. All we have to do is surrender, die to ourselves, allow the work of sanctification, which we talked about last week, to have its way. Remember, that's a purification. That is a... a um, purifying, allowing the Lord to work by His Spirit in our lives. And give it all to Him. It's easier than we make it. We didn't have any part in our salvation. You didn't do a single thing to earn it. And we willingly accept that. That's one thing, for some reason, that in the church, we're cool with that, right? Salvation, yep, I don't have to do anything to earn that. That's good. I'm solid with that. But everything else, we change our doctrinal stance and say, salvation, all Jesus. Everything else, part of Jesus and mostly me. Why is it that we make it so hard to accept him making us righteous? Laura, if you could come up, please. I want to demonstrate something for you. We know that these three jars here represent us. This in a second is going to represent sin, and this is the Lord in our life. Here's our sin guy. He came back this week. We buried him, but he made a reappearance. That's what sin does to your life. Makes you ugly. Uh, it's joking. That doesn't make sense. <laughs> sin, this is our life, and this is what sin will do to you.
But I have good news. The story doesn't end there. When we ask the Lord, Lord, work the process of sanctification. Lord, search my heart we talked about last week. Show me, is there anything in me that is not pleasing unto you? Lord, I'm going to allow your righteousness to be poured into my life. Pretty amazing. Didn't do anything. All you have to do is accept the Lord. You know, and sometimes it says, we've, we've read, he is tempted at all points, yet without sin. Sin tried to come along. Satan tried to come along and actually try to come and tempt this man. Tried to come and get him to stumble. Has it not said in Scripture? And it has, sin has no power over him. And guess what? Because Christ is in you, sin has no power over you as, as well. Guess what can happen, though? Now we turn around and say, oh, really, sin? You think you're going to do that? Guess what? When we introduce Jesus into your life, guess what? Oh, now you can be redeemed, too. Amen. He's the justifier. You can be cleansed, whole, and healed. 1 Corinthians 6, 11. We've read it. We know that it says that we are cir circumcised, sanctified, and now we see that we are justified all in the name of Jesus. Let me remind you here. We have hope in the name of Jesus. We have strength in the name of Jesus. We have power and life endurance, healing, and forgiveness, all in the name of Jesus. We've been circumcised in the waters of baptism. The body of death, this sin guy we talked about, he's been cut away, buried. The source, been buried. And we've been raised in newness of life. We've been sanctified by the power of the Holy Spirit. And let us not forget what that means. To separate from profane things that, and be dedicated unto the Lord. Remember we talked about there may be some things in your life that you need to remove. There may be some people in your life that you need to possibly step away from if they are causing you to stumble before the Lord. To consecrate ourselves unto God. To be purified both externally and internally. Lastly, we are being justified in the name of Jesus. Aren't you grateful for that? <laughs> we are made righteous as we ought to be. We're to press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God called us. I encourage you to press on. The last two weeks we have shared the idea of sanctification and now justification. And I wanted to provide opportunity for you to spend some time. We're done a little early today, so just a few moments. We're not going to belabor this, but whether you stay in your seat or whether you want to come and kneel, it's really up to you. No one's going to call you out or anything like that. It's just a matter of sometimes it's good for you to come and kneel before the Lord. If that's what you want to do, fantastic. But no matter what, we're going to spend some time just waiting on the Lord and saying, Lord, search my heart. If there be anything that's in my life that's not pleasing unto you, Lord, I want you to purify me. Sanctify that in my life. Filter. That's the word I was searching for earlier. Filter those things out of my heart and life. The reason why we talk so much about the heart is out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. We had that conversation this week too, Aiden, didn't we? It's not going to come out of your mouth if it's not already in here. So, Lord, search our hearts. Those things that are not pleasing unto you, Lord, we want to surrender them all. We don't want to hang on to those things. We want, 
to play around in the mud any longer. We're done playing. Done playing church. But we want all that you have for us. So take it all away, oh God. To all that is left is you. Search our hearts, O Lord. Lord, those things that are not pleasing unto you, O God. All that's left is you, O Lord. That's what we want. We want nothing left in our lives, Lord, but what is just you. You're the only thing that matters, O God. We give it all to you. Thank you, Lord. Worthy, worthy art you, O oh God. All that's left is you. Take it all away. Take it all away. Take it all away. For all that's left is you. We surrender to you, God. Come and have free reign. Come and move, O oh God. Reveal by your spirit those things, O oh God, that are not pleasing unto you. Worthy, worthy art you, O oh Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we're done playing. So all that is left is you. Thank you, Lord. Worthy, worthy art you, O oh God. Come and move only as you can today, O oh Lord. Thank you, O oh God. Thank you, Lord. Take it all, Lord. All is left is you. Take it all away. Take it all. Take it all away to all is left in you. Worthy art you, God. All is left is you. Worthy art you, Lord. Thank you. Lord, that you hear us. Lord, you see us right where we are. Lord, we there are many here that have said, search my heart, O God. Lord, by your Spirit, begin to re reveal to them, Lord, things that are not pleasing unto you, O God. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you are faithful and you are kind. Lord, you're going to show them things little by little so that they can continue to overcome those things by your strength, O oh God. Lord, you won't dump a ton of things on them all at once so that they can't even handle it or get discouraged. But Lord, you'll reveal to them. Lord, we pray for your Holy Spirit to come, a spirit of revelation to pour over our hearts. Lord, begin to speak to our hearts even today, O oh God. Lord, that you reveal to them over the next few days, over the next coming weeks, those things that are not pleasing in your sight, O oh God. Cause us to, be, to allow ourselves to be humble before you, O oh Lord. To surrender those things, those things that are not pleasing unto your sight. Those things that will not be beneficial for us in our calling and the purposing that you have for us today, O oh God, in our future. Lord, help us to surrender all that we have to you, O oh God. When we do that, Lord, take it all. Lord, take it all. So the only thing that is left is a reflection 
of you. Lord, we give you permission. Lord, free reign over our hearts and lives to come and weed those things out, Lord, that are not pleasing unto you. We love you, O Lord. We bless your name. Worthy art you, O God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let's stand. In closing, once again, Lord, we just do thank you that you have all things in your hand. Lord, we put our total trust and reliance on you. With every situation that's in our lives, Lord, we continue to remember those that are part of our family or that need a touch from you, Lord. We lift up Bobby down in Georgia, Lord. We ask you to continue to touch him. We thank you that he was able to go home this week. Lord, continue to work a work. Lord, most importantly, that you would draw him to your side, Lord. He would surrender and bow his knee to you, O oh God. Lord, we pray for Bob. We thank you that he's improving as well. Lord, we pray for Carol. Lord, give her grace in this time that, Lord, that you be with her. Lord, we pray for Frida. Continue to strengthen her. Lord, we lift up Jackie, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the purposing that you have in their lives. Lord, we, this house would not be who it is today without those two women. We're grateful for that, O oh God. We thank you, Lord, that you're not done with them. Lord, use them for your glory. Whatever capacity that you have, O oh God, use them. We thank you for the deposit of Christ that's in their lives. And Lord, we just do lift up Daryl once again. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you're giving him strength. Lord, we thank you that you're touching him. Lord, we you come against this uh, the, uh, um, discomfort that he has in his abdomen. Lord, with the fluid or whatever it is, Lord, we ask that you would just take it away. <laughs> Even right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, that you touch him. Lord, that you won't have any pain. Lord, we thank you that the doc I talked to them this week. I said the doctors threw their hands up and they said, we don't have anything we can do. Lord, that's when you're deciding to move. Lord, we don't have any other way to explain it. We can't take, point to anything else but to you to say, look what the Lord has done. It was marvelous in our eyes, Lord, that you receive all the glory and all the honor of that situation. So we thank you for that, Lord. We rejoice for the day when we see him walk in here again to lift his hands to worship you because that's where he wants to be. His desire is to be in the house. Lord, help us not to take that for granted. Lord, opportunity that we have had to be able to come freely. There are those that want to be able to come that can't. So Lord, don't let us, allow us not to take those for granted. That we would come to not forsake the assembly of ourselves. That we would come and choose one another. To consider one another. Lord, we thank you that we can call you Father. We can come to you during our time of plenty. We can come to you during our time of need, and we can cry out to you, Abba, Father. So we do that. We thank you, Lord, that you see us. Lord, we thank you that we are in the palm of your hand, and you have the future as well. We love you today, O oh God. We pray all these things in the mighty name of Jesus, that name that is above every name. Can you say amen?